words before we get going. Um, I just feel truly honored tonight. We have two wonderful, wonderful guests and friends on Lila June and Harriet Sugarman. And Dennis, I would like to thank you so much for being a wonderful co-host. This has been a great ride these five weeks. Thank you, Rivka. You're just wonderful associate director. You've made it so easy for us and you're so helpful. And thank you to Flo Bell and Dan Schneider for making this possible. Dennis. Ah, well, it's great to see everyone again. I, um, I'm extremely thankful to everyone as well. And thank you, Heidi, for um, it's great to meet you and work with you and bring all these wonderful people here. Um, I will start out uh, by introducing Harriet. And then maybe Heidi, you can introduce Lila June, and then we'll start speaking to our wonderful guests. So um, Harriet Sugarman is the executive director of Climate Mama an online community that she founded in 2009 and which reaches individuals in over 110 uh, countries and all 50 states. Harriet chairs the Climate Reality New York City Metro chapter and was a recipient of the Climate Reality 2017 Green Ring Award. She is featured in Al Gore's 2017 book, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Harriet's new book, How to Talk to Your Kids About Climate Change, Turning Angst to Action, was described by the American Library Association as a pointedly apolitical title aimed at easing the climate change conversation between parents and children. She was, uh, lost my place. She was selected as a 2020 New York City climate hero and a 2019 featured speaker at the Global Engagement Summer, Summit at the United Nations headquarters. Harriet is a sought after speaker on solutions to the climate crisis, and we are very happy to have her here. Wonderful to have you, Harriet. And I'm, I'm, I will introduce Lila June, and then the way we're going to do this is, I'm gonna start by asking you questions, Lila, and we'll just be in a conversation. Then we'll bounce over to Harriet, and then we'll be more fluid. So start with you, Lila. Um, Lila, I just want to say the first, the way I discovered you first was by hearing your All Nations Rise song. And if we were a little bit more tech savvy here, I would play it for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. But it's an extraordinarily, I'll just hold it up on my phone. It's just, if you can see it a little bit, All Nations Rise. Everybody should watch this. This blew me away. And then I started following you. And uh, I tracked you down and you were doing a beautiful ceremony uh, for Turtle Island in Central Park. And we, I walked with you there and it was just an extraordinary experience. And, um, and then I brought you to, to Stony Brook University after, um, after um, Standing Rock and you came with a group and you performed and you spoke and it was again, a really powerful experience. So I'll give the little a formal bio and then we can talk. Um, Lila June is a poet, musician, educator, anthropologist, activist and community servant of the Diné Navajo. Um, I cannot pronounce Cheyenne. Maybe you just can... us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and European lineages. She holds a degree in environmental anthropology with honors from Stanford University and a degree in American Indian education with distinction from the University of Mexico. One of the things that. New we... Mexico. New Mexico. What did I say? The newer one. The newer, newer. <laughs> so, the newer, yeah. Um, so one of the things that struck me when, when I first met you was you talked about who you were and then a kind of radical change in your life and what brought you to doing the work you're doing now. Could you, could you tell us about that? Yeah, well, greetings my people and my kin. Initially, I'm from the Black Charcoal streak division of the red running into water clan of the Diné nation also incorrectly known as Navajo. Uh, my father's mother is of the Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne clan. My mother's father is of the Salt clan of the Diné nation and my father's father is of European clans as far as I know. Um, yeah, so, um, well, I think when we're talking about the intersection of race and environment, uh, <laughs> I kind of was born into that. A lot of Native people say, or a lot of people say, oh, stop being so political. And a lot of Native people say I was born political. Um, 
oh, sadly, we're kind of born into a war on our homelands, a war on our women, a war on our water, a war on our humanity uh, each and every day. People think about America as this normal thing, but it's actually an illegal military occupation of indigenous lands. And it's an empire. You know, we are swimming in empire and the effects of empire, which is serious social and ecological degradation. So um, I guess for me, my personal story is um, uh, really about trying to um, find love for myself, you know, because when your people are taken away from their land, you know, 9,000 of my ancestors were put in a concentration camp outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Hitler would study this camp later for his own because it was so efficient. And the only way we were allowed to get out of that camp is if we signed a, a peace treaty, although there was nothing peaceful about it, we were at gunpoint. Um, and one of the articles in this treaty said we had to give all of our children to the US government to be uh, educated. Um, and so that, that's what my grandparents did. They were a direct result of that treaty and they went to a Dutch Christian reform boarding school. A lot of Native Americans, our grandparents all went to boarding schools by and large. Um, there's a study in Canada that says uh, about two of three residential school survivors, they call them boarding school survivors, were sexually abused as children in these, in these schools. So I imagine the statistic is probably the same for the American boarding schools, maybe worse. Um, so we have a lot of uh, uh, dysfunction in our communities because we're trying to uh, stand up again after attempted genocide and several different onslaughts. So uh, I could go on all day about why America shouldn't be normal. Um, <laughs> but I think that affects me because I myself is a, am a survivor of, of uh, sexual abuse and that uh, obviously relates to uh, the earth as we are constantly treating the earth as we treat women or seeing the earth as we see women. Uh, and so I'll just close by saying that, you know, in, in the American paradigm, um, the earth is an object, right, to be owned. And then women are objects to be, uh, they're objectified, let's say, generally speaking. Um, and this also affects the men negatively too, right? Because then their worth is based on either how many women they can sleep with or how much land they own. And so the parallels between women and the earth are very similar. And so um, the destruction of one often is related to the destruction of the other. We see a lot of man camps come into, for instance, the oil fields in North Dakota or the oil fields here in New Mexico where my people are from. And you see uh, the importation of thousands of men to work these oil fields. And what you have is huge spikes in human trafficking, um, missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's just a plague to our community. So oftentimes what you do to the earth, you end up doing to the women of the community. So I think for me to understand my personal story of abuse has helped me to understand the story of abuse of the earth. Um, I could go on, but I don't wanna take up too much time on that. Well, you can go on. Don't ever feel you have to restrain yourself. It's so important what you're telling us. Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to go back a little bit in time to Standing Rock, which is when I last saw you is really just after, after you came from there and you came with the group um, talking about that and presenting on that. Can you tell, tell us about that experience and um, what, what that was like for you and your involvement with that? Yeah, well, you know, I didn't, really mean to become very involved with it but um some people were wanting to bring their guns up to standing rock and i i called the lakota leaders and i said hey you know they're uh trying to bring guns can you remind people that this is a non-violent movement and she said yes i'll do that she said you do it too so i said okay if a lakota woman said i could then i think i can speak about this so i did a little video and i said hey we are here, our greatest weapons are prayer, love, compassion. Uh, our greatest strengths are in fighting this battle with integrity and not lifting any kind of negativity or confrontation or weaponry. And that is how we're gonna win this battle. And so that kind of sparked my, I guess, 
involvement with it. And I think a lot of what I did and continue to do, uh, which isn't always um, popular, is I continue to uh, try and explain why nonviolence is still important <laughs> and why, at least I think, and a lot of my Cheyenne ancestors chose nonviolence as a route for change making. Um, and I think, I don't think I know that if any one of us would have brandished a, a, a firearm at Standing Rock, the movement would have ended very quickly for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so I try to, uh, like I said, not always popular. I get a lot of criticism from certain like uh, factions, but I, for one, am very committed to um, never harming another. Um, and uh, my Cheyenne ancestors were, you know, in, in Sand Creek massacre where uh, hundreds of men, women, and children were massacred after they had formally surrendered. So they had literally given all their guns back and said, we surrender. We don't want to fight anymore. Put us in Oklahoma. We don't care. Just We don't want to fight anymore. And then the cavalry came in and mowed them all to the ground um, and did unspeakable things to them right there in Colorado. And um, so they say that, oh, those Cheyenne men, they didn't take care of their women. They didn't protect them, you know. But what our ancestors and our elders say is actually because of the way we carried ourselves on those days in nonviolence and with uh, just a, a refusal to fight uh, physically um, is the reason that there's even one drop of Cheyenne blood left on the planet because it was that massacre that changed American policy forever. Uh, it was so blaringly obvious who the savage was in that case. Uh, that it was the American government, that from that day forward, extermination was no longer um, uh, permissible. In, in the, and they still did it in more subtle ways, but you couldn't just roll up and gun everyone down anymore. Like, and that turned from policy of extermination to uh, assimilation. That's when they start putting us in boarding schools. And so they say that the way Cheyenne people carried themselves that day is the reason that there's a, blood, a drop of blood Cheyenne blood and other nations too left on the planet. So I tried to bring that into Standing Rock the best I could. It was a beautiful movement. We absolutely won that movement. Maybe we didn't win keeping the pipeline out of the ground, but we won in the sense that we united factions that had never been united. We united Christians with Indians. We united uh, war veterans with Native Americans. We united Every walk of life, many people came from many different countries there, South America, Central America, from Sweden, you know, they had the Samis there. All over the world, the world was watching. And then we also won because we transformed the paradigm of how people think about water. It's no longer a lifeless object, it is life. Um, we also won because we never lifted a weapon and we fought in every way we could. And so my elders always said that process is more important than outcome, right? That's very different from the by any means necessary philosophy, which says, however we got to win, we're going to win. But our elders said, we actually have to walk a certain way. And it is through that walk that we actually already won, regardless of the outcome. And so I was trying to bring that philosophy in the best I could. I very much enjoyed it. It was a beautiful expression of human uh, determination and love. And I think it changed many of us forever. So Lila, I want to ask you something. First of all, I want to honor very much the fact that you know your history, because I think that's so important to move forward that people know the past. And I know um, I've told that story many times about black cattle at Sand Creek, and I know that story intimately. And um, it's such a sad story to me. But by the same token, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you. We had Tiokasin on a couple of uh, shows ago. And I was speaking to him about what I call 180 degrees. And I call that the, Ameri or the Western philosophy of life and the Native American or indigenous philosophy of life that always seems to me like it's in direct polarization. It's always opposite. And so, you know, it's like, how do we get people, maybe you're, maybe you're feeling this energy because um, I feel it from you, but how do we get um, the future to be, to get people to honor the earth as their mother? to see that, like you were saying, how, how it's, do you feel like we've got more women um, in power now that are like, in, in, in my tradition, in the Haudenosaunee, you know, the women are a role model for a lot of the, what I, I believe is just a really great balance to try to balance the earth. So 
when you speak to children and you speak to kids out there and, and you're trying to make a difference, I mean, what do you think, I guess in, in summary, how do, you, how do you feel is the best way we can go forward to turn things around and the perspective of people? Or do you think that the, um, the earth is going to do that for us? <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think that uh, there's, in, in Diné philosophy, there's a several different fundamental truths that we observe. And one is uh, trial and erudition. And so when we experience things, we learn, in other words. And there's negative wisdom and positive wisdom, according to my elder filmer, Blue House. And negative wisdom is when you touch a hot stove and you're like, ouch, that hurts. I'm not going to do that. Positive wisdom is when you experience something that works and you understand that that is uh, a way of living. And so people don't understand this, but native people, uh, I, I'm, correct me if I'm misspeaking, but the Haudenosaunee uh, had the great law of peace come to them because of the warfare they were experiencing. They had already been there, done that. You know, they had already seen what disharmony and contradictory forces and warfare, what it does to a people. And so they had learned the negative wisdom of war, which is peace. That is the wisdom that comes out of war. Um, and so similarly in Chaco Canyon, where my people are from, uh, we had caste systems, we had slavery, we had uh, it's, it's supposedly this great archaeological site, but my people don't go back there because that place is like haunted. You know? like, that's the place where we, it's not haunted, but it's, it's the place where we messed up. Yes, there's great buildings and ruins and da da da, but that's where we started to create hierarchies over each other. And guess what? Creator sent us a drought and that whole society collapsed. And that's how we became that's how some of the Pueblos became Pueblos. We learned and we, we learned from the Pueblo people as Diné people what works. And we realized what works is not caste systems, not slavery. And so I would say kind of to your point, the earth is going to teach us. And that's what's beautiful about the earth is that only sustainable things are sustained here. <laughs> Everything that's not sustainable will collapse. Rome collapsed. America's not even 300 years old and it's collapsing. That is a very brief time. We have uh, fossilized pollen evidence in Kentucky that shows that Shawnee ancestors maintained a chestnut, hickory nut, uh, black walnut, sumpweed, goosefoot, all these edible plant species for 3,000 years straight in the pollen profile. It is persistent. And so that's what my PhD work is on indigenous food systems and looking at how, you know, we, we maintain those things. But my point is that things that work, work, things that don't work, don't work on this mother earth. And one thing that does not work is patriarchy, uh, objectification of living things, uh, commodification of living things, uh, selfishness, hoarding, those things will work for a couple generations, if you're lucky, and then they collapse. And we are now experiencing the precipice of collapse and we're gonna learn a lot. Great. Well, I mean, I, I think you're speaking to right now. Mm -hmm. you know, we're all COVID and climate change and a million other environmental disasters, you know, that go with all that. Near, and we're just kind of like in this what people are calling the great pause i mean we, we go out we get sick we make each other sicker you know um staying in is problematic too uh, because everything's how are people going to feed their families and it, it's we're really in this kind of crazy moment i don't know if you want to maybe bring that in it seems to apply to what you're saying well, um, I've, I've heard that because um, 98% of Native people were wiped out in the first years of colonization, um, they estimate, and, and mostly due to pandemic or epidemics. Um, and my elders say that it was actually not the virus that 
killed us. It was the fear. We had never seen anything like that before. We had never been raped like that. We had never experienced that level of dishonor and, dis and, and strangeness, at least not in many generations we hadn't. And so when that brutal force of colonization that Columbus writes about in his journal, these would make excellent slaves, you know, I'm, I'm sure they did horrific things to the women of the Caribbean. That sparks fear and fear sparks illness. And so that's just one little side note I'll say. Um, but I also think that the chestnut here in America is one of our indigenous foods and it's a sacred food and it's going into a blight. It's going into decline. Um, and part of that is because they were planting them too close together. And we had a very sophisticated and longstanding management strategy for the chestnut forests. Um, we actually created the chestnut forests here. If you look at the pollen record, they don't actually show up till about 3000 years ago. And then all of a sudden, it's just all over the place. So these are man-made forests, man-made food forests. Um, and we manage them with fire. You know, we, we did low intensity burns to clear the understory and we planted them far apart. I talked to a uh, Amamutsan elder who said all of our oak trees, we had a rule of thumb of 13 per acre. We did not have what you see in Santa Cruz, California. Now we have 400 trees per acre. He said these white folks took my land and now it's just 400 trees on an acre and they're all sick trees. So there is a point to what I'm saying. Uh, the urbanization, you know, even though I believe viruses are ultimately in, rooted uh, in fear, um, the close togetherness of human population, you know, mm. the urbanization, a lot of pandemic experts, what have you, have been saying, we are ripe for a pandemic um, and with international travel. And so I think, you know, that that's sort of like the chestnuts. We would plant them far apart and we would, um, we had a sensibility of how, how to strengthen the immune system of a tree, how to strengthen the soil system of a forest. And that applies to human groups too. Um, and, and lastly, I'll just say that I think the, the pandemic is uh, also a gift in a way, which is kind of controversial to say and crazy, but it is showing us how to get local, how to root down, how fragile this economic system really is and what we can do to heal ourselves and our communities. Thank you so much. Um, my last question to you, and then we're gonna to switch to Harriet and then, and then we'll do more of a fluid, a fluid conversation, but um, can you talk about activism? Um, yeah, I, you know, I've always had a, struggled with that word is, uh, I think it was Winona LaDuke who said, um, why does making, why does wanting clean water make me an activist? Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of my ancestors on both sides, I'm half European for the most part, maybe like seven sixteenths European or something. Uh, you know, our ancestors there had a lot of reverence for the earth prior to a lot of the uh, witch burnings and Roman expansion and in inquisitions and crazy stuff that went on there. We were all connected to the earth and to the feminine. Um, and uh, I think taking care of the earth, taking care of water, taking care of women, taking care of men, taking care of elders, taking care of children was a very normal thing to do. It was not like oh, wow, she's really an activist, huh? It's like, no, she's just doing normal stuff that we would do to take care of the world around us. So I've never considered myself an activist, um, although I get put in that category quite often. I've never considered myself radical unless you use the etymology, which means the root, you know, the radish or the, the, the root of things. I do feel like I try to get to the root of things, but... Um, I'm just, ideally, if I do it right, which I'm not perfect at it, but if I do it right, I'm just a woman who is taking care of my people and my people are all people. That's just what we do. 
Fabulous. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Heidi, if it's okay, we can ask, um, start asking some questions of Harriet. Hi, Harriet. How are you doing? I am doing well. So I think, um, I think I would like to start out um, with your book. I mean, and also maybe how um, you got to this point in your life and now you're at this point with this, with this fabulous book. And I just want to hear the story. I'm excited. Okay, sure. And, but first, let me just say it's such an honor to be here uh, with all of you, Lila June, to hear your wisdom uh, and to share it uh, and share the stories, etc. Thank you so much um, for letting me be here um, together with you. So that, and I look forward to our conversation together as well. Um, so my story: I grew up in Western Canada, um, Dennis, and a lot of the stories that um, Lila June was sharing um, growing up in Edmonton with uh, Indigenous communities, but it, you didn't hear, it, it, we didn't come together. And so there's a lot of, um, so much we could talk about there as well, um, and the importance of um, hearing the truth. And that's the basis of my book as well. The, premise of Climate Mama is to tell the truth, that actions speak louder than words and not to be afraid. And I think that a lot of the truth about what, how this country was formed, how Canada was formed, that, you know, the thousands of year history that somehow got pushed to the side um, is, is something that we're, we're missing out on um, in certain ways. And uh, it's the importance of Lila June's voice and many others in sharing that is, is critical. Um, my um, background and coming full circle, I um, started working in the climate movement or, or on, on the climate crisis uh, when I was one of the International Monetary Fund representatives at the United Nations. Boy, if I could be in that position now um, with the wisdom and age that I have, as opposed to uh, that doing that position in the early 90s, um, I would be, it would be different, I think, as well, too, and a different story. But I joined the IMF um, just before the 1992 Earth Summit, and I worked on the preparatory documents uh, for that summit that was held in Brazil. It was the first time the world came together at a head of state level to talk about the climate crisis, to share the reality of what was happening. Had we acted on the urgency that was evident at that moment, we would uh, be in a different place in many respects than we are now. But um, in any event, I spent uh, quite a few years at the UN. I worked on gender issues as well um, with the fund, but none of it seemed directly, um, the way that I was working on it was at this very high level, right, where we um, had heads of state come together to adopt these platforms that were then, um, at the time, we were fighting over ands, buts, and ors, and I didn't recognize the importance of, of that at the time. But now, having your leaders, heads of state, agree to something helps us at the grassroots level um, be able to say, you know, we agree to this, we need to do something about it, and we need to hear all these different voices in different places. Um, anyways, my story progresses in, um, on the, from a perspective on working on climate. Um, when I became a mother, um, my children are now in their early 20s, but uh, at, um, when they were, just in grade school, I did a um, training with the Climate Reality Project in Al Gore while I had been working on uh, climate from an international perspective. Uh, it just woke me up to the realities of what was happening all around us and just seeing it in a different way from, from as a mother, as um, seeing that it wasn't being discussed in a way that I felt it should be. The urgency of what was happening wasn't in my neighborhood uh, where my children were going to school in New York City. People were very concerned about keeping toxins out of their home, what foods they were feeding their kids, but never mind that the world was really telling us and we weren't listening to her. So we weren't listening to 
Mother Earth. We weren't seeing what she was, you know, trying to show us in so many ways that we were creating um, a breakdown um, from our actions, from our burning of fossil fuels, our way, the way that we were managing our food system or not managing it. And so I created at that moment, I was trying to find more information. How do I speak as a parent um, to other parents that I was meeting about um, the crisis that was at hand? And I couldn't find that information um, easily. And so I created Climate Mama, um, a resource for parents to uh, meet other parents, to see examples of what was happening uh, in other communities and to find ways to speak with our kids. Um, fast forward and your song um, was so special to hear it that we need to listen um, to our children. Dennis, thank you so much. And um, for me, uh, two years ago, well, our children have been speaking and we ha I didn't seem that we were hearing them in the way that we should be hearing them. And then um, all of a sudden it seemed we were hearing them more clearly, but uh, the parents that I was meeting didn't really have the words to be able to address what their children were, were saying to them, whether it was um, through fear, for, for, through activism, through um, concern, through hopes, and so I wrote um, this book that I've been writing for a long time with Climate Mama and with our blog and with our website, but uh, I was able to package that together at a moment in time where I think um, it was really important uh, to be able to share different ways that we can address our kids. But before we can do that, uh, we need to take a step back and understand what's happening so we can begin to tell them the truth, but we need to know what it is. So we need to understand the science. We need to understand the political mess that got us into the system. We need to understand the, uh, the uh, inequalities, the justice issues, how and why all of these things are connected and must be connected, the health impacts. And then we can begin to have those conversations with our kids um, from a place of, you know, where they're at, uh, too, because different children will be at different places and children can be very young kids to children with children of their own, um, as we talked about earlier, but, uh, and we'll all be at different places uh, where we are at. And certainly, you know, in this one small book, I, um, I have a section on grief and coming to terms with the sadness that we face when we realize where we're at um, in terms of our climate emergency uh, and all of these different parts you know i can just talk about them in, in a little bit um, a section on environmental racism and justice well again we need to be hearing from lila june directly we need to be really having serious deep conversations that connect as heidi said um, the impacts of COVID, they, how do we not see that the individuals who are hurt first and worst are um, people from low-income communities, people that have we've dumped poison on, whether it's from uh, um, power plants or food insecurity, et cetera. How do we not make those connections? Yet people don't, um, and many, many, um, people that I meet um, don't see those connections. And I think that it's important and, and there's an opportunity in a way, um, as Lila June said, in some ways you know, with COVID that it brings out an opportunity in a way to, because people are listening and people are seeing and coming together as, as a community too, right? We're seeing that we at the community level can do things, even very complicated, difficult things. We can support one another. We can take measures because we're concerned about our elders or, uh, so there are many ways that we are uh, having our eyes open because of the tragedy that we're in. So those are you know, many different stories. You asked me a simple question. I 
tried to connect many different dots, but uh, that's uh, how I got to write the book and it came out um, in May of this year. I want to jump in here um, and ask you some questions as a fellow mom or parent. I know a lot mm -hmm. of us, are, we're all parents, we're all mothers and fathers mm -hmm. and children and daughters and sons. And um, But I, I had a similar experience of, I came into this work, um, well, I had cancer, my parents had cancer, and that was sort of my initial wake up call was it's, and I was pretty young when I had cancer. It was on the heels of my parents having had it and passed away from it. And that was my, and it was before anyone was talking about climate change, just going back a long time ago. And for, and that was my sort of wake up call. Something's weird. Like this is just not right. There's too many cancers in this small family. And I'm awfully young to get cancer. And then I started to read about it and read about all the pollution in our environment. And I asked my oncologist and he said, you know, yeah, there's a lot more cancer than there used to be. And yes, I do think it's because of environmental pollutants. Um, and then when I got pregnant, that was sort of my, my really big wake up call was, it's one thing if I'm sick, it's another thing if I'm bringing a life into this world and I can't protect that little person. You know, the instinct is you want to take care of your child and you realize there's only so much a parent can do in a world where it's just environmentally extremely chaotic and out of our control in a lot of ways. And so that was really, this profound moment of grief as you described and i feel like um i've never really fully come out of that but it certainly motivated me to do more and to realize it wasn't just about my child you know it's all of our children it's all of us and then of course realizing that my child's far more privileged than most children and i could do a lot more for her to protect her than so many people can and feeling really horrible about that and so I'm going to segue in a little bit where we are now. So I'm living in a location, and so is Dennis, or all of us on the East Coast, and of course, there's storms everywhere. But we just had this really sort of actually moderate storm, as storms go. And, um, you know, the last time there was a really bad storm was Sandy, and there was this big uproar, right? That was, that was a big moment for climate awareness. People in suburbia and in New York City, in this metropolitan, big, wealthy area with lots of people, had this moment of, oh my God, maybe this is real. This is really, a you know, and it was, it, it was profound, profoundly changed the consciousness around climate change. And so I'm still in the same house I was in then. And of course, we have, as we often do, if there's a storm, a blackout because there's no infrastructure. Right, there's zero infrastructure, and how we're living, as Lila, you're saying, um, we're not living in a way that's sustainable. Just the whole setup is just so fragile. It's just, it, you know, if you look around outside my door, it's just like waiting to collapse. It's a miracle that, it, I mean, it's just a miracle that we it, it functions every day to me. Actually, if you know, it's like we're just sort of waiting for everything to just. Push, burn up, blow up, something, right? It's like we're just, you know, between all the different things, nuclear weapons or climate change or, you know, the, the grids we're on and the, and the expectation, I mean, just you can go on and on. Um, but what really hit me was we have done absolutely nothing to, that I can see since Sandy to act differently. It's as if, oh, that happened. Whoa, wake up. And then we went back to business as usual. I mean, is there really any significant change so the, and then there's the different pieces of it which are all the things we're doing to perpetuate the destruction and then absolutely no action in sort of trying to take care of our ourselves just knowing storms are coming storms are here wildfires are here droughts are here pollution is here and like no so I open that up for discussion because that's sort of where my mind is right now. Although I will say this, I'm very happy that Kamala, Kamala was picked. It was like a moment right before I came on of like, okay, something nice and positive. Cause it's a dark, it's a hard time. We're in a hard, at least for me, I'm, I'm in a hard moment. I can't speak for everyone, but you know, I, up and down, but it's, a, it's, so these questions are on my mind. I'm just curious what you all think. Yeah. Well, so on a couple different levels, Heidi, let me just jump in. And so I think, climate is being talked about in a much bigger way than it was before. You look, we're in a presidential election year. I mean, there's so much craziness around that anyways, but 
it with, on the democratic debate stage, it was talked about all the time. It, it should have been talked about more and more, but it never, it wasn't there before. I think at a community level, at a state level, at a community level, um, it is, it is being discussed, you're right, we need more action. Clearly, um, the infrastructure in the United States, um, the built environment is, hasn't been updated. The whole idea of um, building back better, building back um, as we come back from COVID, et cetera, it has to be done in a way that shores up and builds us forward, that brings in environmental and climate justice as part of that discussion not only discussion, but that is the idea of this of a Green New Deal. What does that really mean? We have to build back better. We have to have everybody as part of how we do that. But let's bring it down to a community level and a family level. As our, mm -hmm. you're right, right? Are we prepared? Well, just as you have a fire emergency plan, we each family, each community should have a climate emergency plan. You should understand when those big storm comes, where is your go kit? Where is your, you know, do you live in a community that's susceptible to forest fires um, because they're stronger and faster, you know, as we've seen with the tragedies of many of the fires on, on the West Coast um, in the, just in the past few years. So how, how do you prepare yourself? Because we need to be prepared, you're right. It's only, the storms are only getting stronger. Um, and so how do we prepare ourselves? Your children's school, you know, is it prone to flooding? They should have lifeboats. Literally, they should have boats, lifeboats that can be blown up to get kids out of that. That should be part of the plan of the, of the school. So as a parent, how do we talk to our, um, our, our, our school boards, et cetera, about building climate resiliency uh, in so it's not only adapting to what's coming, but how are we going to shore up and make sure that our families are safe, that our children are safe? So I think you're you're right. It has to be more than a conversation. What did we learn since Sandy? Many communities have learned, um, you know, many things, but we haven't implemented it with this sense of urgency that's required. Will each storm be a wake-up call? Last summer. You know, the heartland of America was flooded, our, where our food supply comes from. Um, people forget in a moment, right? Because then all of a sudden the store is filled again. Well, it isn't. And, it, and you're right. We're, you know, we're one storm away from things breaking down. So we need to understand that. And then we need to, I think, to provide for our children through our actions, through discussing this, through demanding it. We do what we can and those that can do more must do more. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear more from Lila June. How do we learn from indigenous knowledge? From uh, how do we make our communities and our land stronger, etc. But there is so much we have to do. And you're right, we're running out of time. So once you know that, we have to continue to demand that and do what we can and demand that those can do more, do more. I think that's very appropriate. That's great. Um, and I'm listening to everything everyone's saying. And I want to tell you, my biggest concern is always sustaining the energy. You know, I feel like, how do we keep it going? I know when, um, with, the, uh, with the death of John Lewis, I remember him telling so many stories about how, well, something happened and we had this big event and, you know, um, and then everything seemed to be moving forward. And then all of a sudden everybody forgot about everything. And, and as you just said, everything just goes back to normal again. So I'm going to take a little bit of a turn here, Lila, because I want to know more about your um, creativity and your music and um, maybe your activism, as you call uh, that we call it. But um, I see that Harriet has written a great great book and I know your music is a big part of it. We had Gina Belafonte on last uh, last time and she spoke about the role of musicians and artists and creators in, in uh, and I feel that for myself as well. I feel like I really want to, to um, put all my energy into sustaining the message so that somehow it doesn't just always keep going back to uh, you know another place and keep it going. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, so, well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I feel like my music has accidentally kind of blown up. I, I'm, I'm more like a scholar, I guess you could say, and a community organizer 
and um, I kind of did music on the side and then all nations rise went viral and then I all of a sudden was a full-time touring musician pretty much for like two years straight until COVID hit uh, which was great that I stopped doing that because it turns out to be kind of hard on the system um, but I don't know. I don't know if music is the way to sustain a movement. Um, I think it's a way to sort of like fertilize a movement, um, to feed a movement, to nourish a movement. Um, and, and in that sense is sustained, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to put those words into practice and songs are made of words words are very important I, i've always said poets are very important because we create what we believe and if poets and musicians work in the realm of thoughts and the realm of beliefs which is wonderfully connected to the realm of feelings because when you listen to music you're learning on all those levels not just intellectual but emotional um and that's great and so i think that's the the it definitely feeds that and then but but it, i guess what i'm saying is it's not the whole picture um and i think kind of to the point of how thoughts are like the cradle of creation um we have this problem going on that's been going on for a long time which is essentially Eurocentric Enlightenment era hijacking and gatekeeping what is knowledge, what is real, what counts as knowledge. And so basically you have all of indigenous knowledge systems getting not only swept under the rug, but not even acknowledged. Um, African traditional knowledge systems Aboriginal indigenous knowledge systems, Asian and even European indigenous knowledge systems were swept under the rug to make way for this Greco-Roman thing. I mean, even the word Europe is a Greco-Roman word that was plastered over all of these indigenous communities across what we now call Europe. Um, and so I think that honestly, I, this is really hard to articulate on such a short Zoom call, but what I'm trying to say is that to, to sustain the movement, to change the way we operate on a daily basis, you actually have to go under the hood of our paradigm and start working on that. And that's where I think not only music contributes, but also academia, that if academia had more room for indigenous languages, indigenous, and, and uh, for, for instance, let me give an example. One of the tenets of Eurocentric ideology is that it's okay for humans to play God, right? We can mess around with genetics. We can mess around with uh, chemicals. We can create our own fragrances. We can divert whole waterways. We can dam waterways. We can break what the creator has made. And not only is that okay, but that's actually glorious. Look at this dam, the Hoover Dam, one of the greatest engineering feats of mankind. You know, that core tenant that it's okay and even glorious for human beings to play God, that thing needs to be addressed. Um, and I would dare say that's one of the real important roots of our climate crisis because I could go on and on. I'm gonna try not to just ramble forever. I, I'm trying to keep it succinct, but let's just take fossil fuels for an example. We believe that creator put those in the earth for a reason. Everything has a purpose. Every bird, every deer, every rock, every oil shale, that those are the lubricants of the tectonic plates. The coal is like, the liver of the earth, it's a filtration system. Everything is there for a purpose. 
And we call ourselves Nahokad Diyin Dene'e. And I, when I say ourselves, I don't just mean Dene people. We call humanity Nahokad Diyin Dene'e, which means holy earth surface being which means we don't drill under the earth's surface. And if I was a real, real good Navajo, I wouldn't get on airplanes because we don't even go out of the earth's surface. Because one time, I'll just end with this story. I was in Menominee territory in Wisconsin and uh, we were leaving the next day. We said, well, we're getting on our flight tomorrow. And, and the, the elder said, oh, I'm so sorry. I was like, why? He said, well, I'm, I'm going to put some tobacco down for you. I said, why? He said, you're not supposed to go up there. You know, I, I'm putting some tobacco down because there's spirits up there. And uh, I'm asking them to, 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 to take care of you while you're up there because you're not supposed to go up there. <laughs> I was just like, he said, yo, he said, if you were supposed to go up there, creator would have given you wings. <laughs> so I think that but but in the american paradigm it's wonderful we can fly now we can go from san francisco to new york city in five hours and it's just this great engineering feat and who cares if creator didn't give us that ability naturally let's just do it because the more cool stuff you do the more civilized you are the more awesome you are and that farther ahead you are of china and brazil and you know Russia and or rather and so it's just I think those core tenets is what if anything music can do to sustain the movement would be to help change those core paradigmatic tenets that we are all operating on. Can you say a little bit can you would you mind saying a little bit more Lila about changes as an academic I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this changes that you would you'd like to see in education and how that could help? I think every college student should gain a proficiency in an indigenous language. You're on our land, why shouldn't you learn our language? The language is the, is the sound of the, of the land speaking through us. If you know the language, you're gonna know the land or at least let's say two years, every whether they're white, black, native, Pacific Islander, who cares what race the student is, they need to study indigenous language. And what does that do? That does two things. One, it offers them insight into the paradigm that functioned on this land for thousands of years, thereby giving them some tools of how they might be able to function here for longer than 300 years, which is America's not even 300 years old. It's already collapsing, but um, it also is a symbolic gesture because you're saying, hey, this language is important enough to be a core subject. Uh, study, I mean, maybe you've seen Michael Apple's work, uh, Glenaba Martinez, they talk about selective tradition in American schooling and how the tradition, which is right now it is chemistry, geometry, Shakespeare, there's a few, you know, common themes we see every kid know about, but we don't ever acknowledge that all of those are Eurocentric in nature. That the tradition, the tradition that becomes a traditional education here in America is selected out of so many different worldviews that we could have chosen from. African uh, worldviews of which there are thousands within that continent, indigenous worldviews in Canada and in, in what we call America, Central America, South America, Australia, of all the diversity of worldviews that we could teach our children, we select this narrow little one that is all based in Eurocentric Enlightenment era. So we need to acknowledge the selective tradition, acknowledge that it upholds white supremacy, acknowledge that it it, it impoverishes our children. You go to Europe, those kids speak four languages, every single one of them. We might speak one and a half here. Anyways, I'm gonna get off my soapbox, but I think the selective tradition is, is something we need to examine. Well, I think that's great. And that plays right into what we were talking about before about the, um, you know, 
when I um, would do programs in the schools, I found that the, the, um, the school would only speak about Native uh, history in third grade and maybe seventh grade, and it was never taught as a mature subject. It was always taught with the stereotypes, and it was always taught like you learned it uh, about Indians, and then it was over, it was done, you know. And they never really studied that Haudenosaunee Confederacy, how it was formed, um, what they learned from it, and all that, and that's really, really missing from uh, the curriculum. And we had somebody ask about the seventh generation philosophy. I mean, even Harriet could speak to that. I think that we... Um, we, uh, we try to make our decisions based on our children and our children's children and how the world is going to be for them. And um, if you want to speak to that, someone asked about that. So, Can I also just segue to from the, how climate is taught also just as a science uh, sure. in our, in our, in, for, for our, our students, whether at high school or middle school and that that also needs to be transcended and become cross-curricular and we're um we need to demand that both as parents but as educators as well too um and that brings in many facets um what and i think it's the idea that we should be learning indigenous languages i have not heard that before lila and thank you i think that would be in you know so important and bring a base of knowledge that you're right would maybe open people's minds in different ways um but i think there that we have stuck to these very core subjects and and put different things in different buckets and we need to look at again our climate emergency cross-curricular how is it impacting um us and then inspire our children to to take their passions, if they are musicians, if they are poets, if they, that they have to um, be able to explore those from a lens of how does that, how is that going to help further our, you know, addressing the climate crisis? And, and you know, again, bringing the whole picture together maybe takes time, which we don't have, but we need to create, but that they shouldn't be discouraged that there isn't a role for those poets and the musicians in the movement um, as we live our climate emergency because we're going to be living it for the rest of our lives. Um, and so, again, not to shut down our, 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 our children um, wherever they're at, but that they learn that they can do that. So I think that's an important thing also. So I just wanted to throw that in. I hope that's okay. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And I, I want to jump on that myself and add to that, which is, I think, you know, there's this idea that um, with environmental issues, if you don't know all the details of the science, you can't participate in some way. And that's just not true. Um, you know, climate change is sociological. It's environment. It's it's it affects women, Lilo's children. It it impacts every aspect of our lives, and um, the changes that we need to make are on every level and every part of society. So it's not just about you know carbon emissions. Yes, it's about carbon emissions, but then there's so many other factors involved with that. You know how we get to places, how we build things, how we travel, how we travel, how we live. Do we live in small groups or little groups? Do we live, you know, it just, you can go on and on. And so I think it's, it's very, um, it's a very mono way of looking at things to say it's just science. And it's also a very um, exclusionary way of looking at things because it presumes if I don't have this knowledge that the great scientist on that top of the mountain has, I can't understand it and I can't do anything about it. And I don't really think that's true. Um, so, and, and I work in the humanities and I'm able to translate, part of what I do is translate all of that um, in a way that's comprehensible. And often it's not that complex. I'm not gonna work with it in a laboratory. No, I'm not gonna do the modeling and the studies, but I do a lot of other things. Um, and, and some of my students will go do that. Some of them work in, you know, study atmospheric science and some of them study marine science and some of them are doing environmental science, but some of them are writing, some of them are historians, some of them are going to go do architecture. Uh, so it's just, it's, I feel like it's a way of sort of compartmental, we, we have so much compartmentalization in our culture and it's a way of um, both alienating people so they feel they can't do anything um, and also 
absolving us. Well, I don't have that skill set, so I don't have to do it. It's not my job. I don't have to do. And that's just not really true. Um, so I'm all, that's one thing I love about sort of interdisciplinary learning is you start to figure out everything's connected and um, it's not as abstract and as far away as, as it can seem. Um, but we, we have a lot of questions and, and um, uh, a, a good one here about um, with regard to events caused by climate change, uh, storms, forest fires, and so on, what existing evolving models can the world look to in an effort to prevent, prepare, or react to those events in the immediate future? I don't know if either of you want to respond to that. Please go ahead, Harriet, if you'd like to go first. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, you mentioned fires. Um, so it turns out that this entire continent was heavily managed by indigenous peoples and densely populated. And we've been here a lot longer than the Bering Strait theory. There's plenty of evidence for this. Um, and a lot of it is swept aside as bad data or anything that doesn't fit the, I mean, to be honest and frank, the white supremacist narrative gets thrown out as, as bad data. Um, but the way that we managed this land, uh, a lot of one major way was through fire. Um, in this Shawnee forest, you know, that we see the uh, pollen, fossilized pollen, the sediment cores that we can analyze and see you know, what pollen was present at different stages in time. Uh, one of these cores is 10,000 years old at the very base, and it gets younger and younger as you move up. Uh, for 3,000 years, you see fossilized charcoal in the record. And this is indicative of what Native people have always known and some scientists know about, which is we manage the land with fire. And um, some parts of the US still do this. Um, most have completely forgotten about it. Um, if you look at the Australian fires, what I did really like about the Australian government is various state governments uh, turned to indigenous peoples and started saying, hey, uh, we know we messed up. How can, can, can you advise us on how to prevent this from happening in other places? And they're actually integrating indigenous uh, fire, um, fire setters and they call it cultural burns. If you YouTube Aboriginal cultural burns, you'll get a lot of information. Um, in California, mm -hmm. there's a book called Tending the Wild, um, the one of many books uh, that just discuss how California natives, uh, which there were at least 80 languages spoken in the state of California at the time of contact, mutually unintelligible languages. So it was a very diverse happening place even back then. Um, was also one of the most biodiverse places in the continent. Um, linguistic diversity and biodiversity happened to have a correlation uh, according to some of the maps coming out. Um, but this entire state of California was heavily burned um, at the right time of year in a low intensity manner. Um, and like I said, the Santa Cruz uh, tribe of what is now Santa Cruz, California is the Amamutsan and their leader, Val Lopez, talks about how they would always have 13 trees per acre, right? So you actually space out the trees and they are usually food trees because you're trying to sustain your community. Um, and the um, understory being cleared attracts deer, it attracts undulates that you can then hunt if you would like. We never fenced in our cattle. We just had the bison come to us because we knew how to make nutrient dense grasslands with fire. Um, and so essentially, I think those are models we can look to. Um, uh, I think, how do you operationalize that? How do you get California counties to start burning in ways that are led by indigenous peoples? Well, we, we butt up against, again, that, that gatekeeping of how only Eurocentric knowledge counts as knowledge. So when we have the humility as Americans to admit that indigenous peoples are not just uh, spiritual earth lovers, but they're also very advanced scientists who have a lot of your ecological sophisticated knowledge that can help us. 
then we will take them out of that box of the, you know, earth loving spiritual fairy nymph who never touches the ground and realize that we are actually very influential in the way the land looks and tastes. And so I think, I think that's just one model is looking at indigenous pyrodiversity and how we would use fire in low intensity burns at the right time of year to manage the soil systems, the forest systems, and to um, prevent catastrophic fires. And may I just add too that to um, the concept of events uh, related to climate, climate is a threat multiplier, right? So climate makes everything worse. Climate is going to make uh, fires more intense and worse. Fire, climate makes um, food insecurity worse. Climate makes injustice worse. Climate makes, so the, emerg the emergency of our climate crisis uh, is a threat multiplier. So remembering that in terms of how we deal with events is that, you know, we, we have to come to that understanding where we have to deal with it all together. You can't just pick, I'm going to fight the climate crisis or I'm going, you know, it's, it's all related. And so making sure we are worrying about people's health, their food security, their water, um, our land around us, and learning um, from Indigenous knowledge, opening ourselves up to different ways. Um, as Lila said, there is, it cannot just be one way. There are a billion ways. There are as many ways as there are people on the planet. Um, and we have to open ourselves to that and then understand that because of that, we each can make a difference. Even though we need systemic change, we need huge change. And yes, as Heidi said, we're, we're running out of time and we're coming up against you know, more intensity every time there is an event that happens. Uh, you know, will systems collapse? They are collapsing. Will, you know, as again, as Lila said, the 300 year collapse of the American empire, it, it's collapsing, you know, but, but how do we sit, create hope for our children for, for a future? Um, and we can do that. I think that we can't give up on that because w there are so many different ways to open our minds and our ways forward um, that, that that should bring us hope too. So um, just to, I'll stop at that. I, I have a question for um, for you all, for both of you, which is um, when I was younger, I had the really amazing opportunity of living in a community that was an intentional community. And it was a very small school within it. And we didn't get into cars very much. And we grew a lot of our own food. Or we, if we ate red meat, often it was a, an animal that had been killed, you know, the, a deer that had been hit. And somebody would bring us the deer. Um, and we ate very little meat otherwise, but pretty much it was very sustained. And this is long before all this stuff was cool. <laughs> People thought we were very weird. Um, but, but anyway, I guess my question, I mean, I keep thinking and I teach cl my uh, classes, we look at this, you know, what are other ways we could live? And for a lot of my students, that's a novel idea, you know, living like I did when I was a kid um, or the way obviously indigenous people have lived for thousands of years. Um, but, um, but what do you think about that? About because people are building intentional communities now, where they're living and they're sharing their energy, or they're creating solar array that a whole community shares, and they're building gardens together, and um, they're finding alternative ways of of building uh, sustainable infrastructure. So I don't know if either one of you want to speak to this idea of intentional communities. Well, let me just say to you, Heidi, though it can be it look very differently in different places, right? It can exist in New York City, right? And and we should be looking at how we build our buildings and how we can grow food um, on our buildings and uh, on the outside and on the, and how we conserve uh, rainwater. And how, so, you know, we need those architects, we need those engineers, um, we need to, un, you know, create places that aren't food deserts in, in cities too. Uh, so I think, um, you know, there are different kinds of communities depending on where you are too. So it doesn't mean necessarily deconstructing all of our cities in every place that we live. You know, there are, I, so I just want to offer that up too. Yeah, I think, um, I think especially, especially with COVID, you've heard of a panic planting, I think they call it, where everyone's planting gardens. Um, um, there's some pretty incredible literature about localizing food systems. Um, 
and its effects on the economy, on global warming, um, on community resilience. And uh, there's a group in the Northern Ohio region who did a study, kind of a hypothetical study, but they crunched some numbers and they found that if they were to localize just 25% of their food system, they would create, I forget, tens of thousands of jobs and even revenue for uh, tax revenue for the community. Um, obviously economic power for the community itself. Um, and they actually were tying it to climate as one of the greatest untapped green economy or maybe like least talked about green economy sectors. When we think about green economy, we th or at least I think about windmills and uh, what do you call it? Solar panel farms and all that. But they're talking about the localization of food systems as a green economy, um, which sequesters carbon and just generally makes people more happy when I have my little garden outside and I, I've never been able to because I've always been on the road, but um, it's just quite healing to, to grow with these plants and to learn from them. I think it's Robin Wall Kimmerer says that in some languages, the word for plant translates to the ones who take care of us. Um, and so I think, I mean, I think your question is really important, Heidi, because it's like, how do we operate? That's always the big question. How do we operationalize these things? How do we actually do it? It's not just an idea, but we actually start seeing it around us. Um, and I, I, what I would say to that is, it doesn't take a very big model to change the world. Um, it just takes a model that works. So even if it's a small scale, if you can generate something that works and have a very efficient communication outlet to communicate to the world that it does work, it changes the way people think about food and water. And so I would say, you know, forget about scale for now because it's just too daunting to think about, but just work on a local model that works. And if it doesn't work, fine tune it, tweak it, find a way to get it to work. The ones that will work, I think are usually indigenous led or at least indigenous in. Oop, Lila froze on us. I'm sure she'll be back. Oh, she's back. You froze for a second there, Lila. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I don't... Okay. Yeah, I wanted to just throw in uh, when you were talking about the fires and the trees in California and everything. I know that I really feel like the water is such a big issue too, the, the management of water. And, and so it all kind of comes together. I think we're kind of running late here and we've got a couple more questions. But anyway, what I wanted to say was, um, you know, it's like they keep taking water and taking water from the rivers and then it affects the fish and it creates these dry, dry environments in different places. And maybe with these community um, community gardens, community food sources, uh, everything coming back to a community way of life, which is the opposite of an individualist, uh, putting the individual first, but putting, uh, you know, as 180 degrees, putting the community first, maybe that we can start thinking about being more sustainable in that regard. Um, anyway, uh, we have just another person here who, who, well, first he had a comment and he said, only Western science denies the interrelatedness of things. I don't know if that's true, but we can talk about that. But then he comes back and he asks a question and, um, he says, can you discuss how the notion of ethical relationship to land is not a part of climate science? Lila June is spot on about the epistemological model of Western European post-enlightenment era academic tradition having no room for merging human ethics and human thought into the notions of science. Ironically, the theoretical quantum physicists learned exactly that the universe is not a determinate, fixed, eternal, external reality. They admitted that the universe is in flux in which your own perception and thoughts and actions have an influence on the world. And I think what we're talking about here is well, I'll let you answer that as far as the um, our relationship and our and how that is affected by climate by science in quotes. Either one of you is good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think though that in fact we are hearing science and scientists 
uh, speak about existential the, the existence of the human species is it is are we going to continue uh, in very scientific um, meetings that that it, it isn't you know science scientists are people as well too they have children um, they are concerned about what they're seeing and what they're happening uh, what's happening and I think there is uh, you know we I personally believe that that it's important that we do have that uh, peer-reviewed science and data that shows us what, what's happening in addition to what we're seeing happening but then we also hear from scientists who are speaking up and speaking out about the ethical concerns that they see um, th that we aren't dealing with the emergency that's happening. So um, I think there is a, 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 clearly as the question or the person who asked the question an importance of connecting both but I think we're seeing it more and more that scientists too are raising that level of concern um, and not, not all of them but, ma but many are speaking out where we weren't hearing them speak out before to raise those exact um, issues that make those connections to the destruction that we're causing um, beyond just the pure science. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I wanted to just shout out to the Seven Generations New Deal. Um, I ran for office in New Mexico, which was a whole other story. Um, turns out taking on the fossil fuel lobby is not as fun as it sounds. Um, but uh, during that time, even though I didn't get to get to the election day, <laughs> um, we did generate um, the Seven Generations New Deal as a community-based um, policy. And it's sgnd.info if you want to see it. It's the seven-point plan, uh, sgnd, which stands for Seven Generations New Deal. And it's essentially an indigenous take on the seven on the Green New Deal, but it also has a lot of actionable items. We one thing we didn't we thought the Green New Deal needed was more actionable, concrete steps instead of just principles and uh, ideas, values, which are important. Um, but there wasn't a lot we could draw from in terms of like what are we going to do on the ground. Um, so it's seven principles and seven actions that you can take on a policy level. Um, but I think your, your question about uh, the absence of an ethical um, relationship to land as part of a science, climate science, I, I think, I don't even know where to start with that one, but I guess one thing I could say is that English is, it's not a very warm and fuzzy language. It's, a, it's kind of more intellectualized, it's more um, egotistical, uh, objectifying noun based uh, in in Diné language you know we have a lot of warm and fuzzy words <laughs> like um, chine. chine means my beloved my, my precious my precious friend my precious relative she you know my precious child um, when 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 we speak you know I would never say if we were in my community, I would never say, hi, Heidi, hi, Dennis, hi, Harriet. I would say, which means, hello, my little mother. Uh, hello, my maternal uncle. You know, my, hello, my older sister. Um, in fact, it's considered rude to call people by their first names. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it's hard when from the very beginning, the language that we give people to speak with removes that ethical relationship, which in my language is keh, keh. It's a very simple word, but it's, it packs a lot of meaning, which is kinship, uh, interdependence, um, accountability, responsibility to help each other, compassion, uh, but really kinship. That's why when I started, I say yat eh, keh, keh greetings my kin you know that's how we start everything off um so that's just a little bit but i i'm sure we could talk about that question for a long time and, and let me just one quick also uh website to send people to the feminist agenda for a green new deal um which is just a feminist green new deal dot com with all which also brings in many of the uh, things we 
started discussions on, but uh, as well, I would suggest people have a look at that too. Great, great. Well, Heidi, I think we ought to start closing. Oh, there's Rivka. She's back I, I agree, and I just have to say, Lila, that totally just, oh my God. It just caught me like through my mind and my heart. Wow. Hmm. If I wanted to learn, Danae, how would I do that? I just, I <laughs> There's not. actually Rosetta Stone, believe it or not. We're one of the <laughs> one of the few tribes with the Rosetta Stone. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Maybe that's what I'll do right now. COVID. Learn learn Danae. Um okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I just want to, I really want to thank you both. Um, I'm just really honored that you came on. This is a difficult time. I'm sure you're busy and I have a million things going on, but I thank you. And I think, and I just want to thank everybody because this is, this is our last, our last in five and we've covered amazing. I mean, I'm just so interesting, the perspective of like what to do from, from Lila and Harriet to Mark Jacobson and Michael Mann, which was in the very beginning, you know, um, really a range in here of, of different philosophies and approaches and thinking and all of it wise, all of it important. Um, but I'm so glad we got to conclude with this because it's just deeply, really personal and meaningful and powerful and touches me. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Yes, and me too. I just thank you so much. Nyawagoa. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm so honored to be doing this with you and meeting, meeting both of you and all the guests that we met. It was just great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's nice to spend time with you all. Thank you all. And thank, thank you. you all who joined us tonight. Um, you can find all of our distance learning webinar series at globalangels.com. And our website is global.org. Global We're so grateful that you joined us. And this is now going to be a resource that you can all go back to. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.